Okay, today I'm going to be making a hand tool. Um, it's got a pretty specialist use, so uh, it's probably worthwhile me showing you guys um, what it's used for. Um, uh, this uh, this sort of lock core here is known as a SFIC or small format interchangeable core, um, and this is designed uh, so the actual end user or, or, or customer can change locks themselves without the the, the assistance of a locksmith. Um, there's basically two keys. There's a standard operating key that uh, operates the lock as normal, and then there's something called the control key, which when that's used, it will retract this little bar system on the side and allow you to pull the entire core out of the lock. Now, I'm sure uh, many of you have actually seen this, but you probably haven't realized. Um, nearly every aluminum frame door in, say, a shopping mall will have this on the front of it, and it's exactly one of these. Um, but they also make uh, padlocks that take this core as well. Um, they look like this. And the problem is, if the customer or end user removes um, the lock core, what you don't want to happen is the, all the guts of the lock to fall out, so the ball bearings, the actuator and stuff. Um, you want that to stay in place if you, if you take this core out. So consequently, the way they design these actuators is there's a small sort of washer on part of that coil spring, which will actually rotate and snap in place when it's pushed into the lock body. And it's a real pick to try and get out. Um, so that's what this tool does. It, it's a specialist tool for removing actuators from best padlocks. Um, <laughs> I can't see there being a huge market for this, but I imagine that, that a few people will take one off me. Um, the, the manufacturer who makes this, a company called uh, Stanley Best, uh, they make uh, a slightly different design tool for exactly this purpose, but with most things in the locksmith trade, it's horrendously expensive for what it actually is. Um, yeah, I, I'll give a quick demonstration, see if I can show you it working. Okay, you can see this hole here in the tool, um, a, a brass pin will be pressed in there and uh, that will enable the tool to be uh, aligned correctly in the padlock and then as you twist that will prevent over rotation as well. Um, so yeah, it's a simple case of putting the tool in the lock, um, engaging with the actuator and uh, pulling it and uh, yeah, it grabs hold of the actuator and pulls it out. And it's basically, you can see that tiny little tang on the end of the tool sneaks up underneath that uh, that um, part of the actuator engages and allows you then to uh, to pull the actuator out. Right, having a look at the design a little bit closer, um, the main problem I've got is this tiny little tang that sticks out the end of the uh, the tool that snags the actuator. It's it's 38 thou um, thick, and the arc extends out almost a quarter of an inch, um, so it's a pretty small cross-sectional area, and um, if I attempt to make this out of uh, bronze, brass, aluminum, uh, simply the, those materials don't have the tensile strength and you'll very quickly bend and bust off this little tang. Um, now, it, it, the, the test pieces that I've cut already are made from just regular mild steel and you can probably see at the end of this one the problem with using plain steels um, as hand tools and that's the acids in your, your hand are, are great promoters for corrosion. And you'll just get the surface rust almost immediately um, if I made it out of out of a steel. Uh, ideally, I'd want to make it out of a medium carbon steel and, and temper it so this little tang um, was, was pretty strong. Um, but I, I think the trade-off uh, for strength um, versus um, uh, it not rusting is, is far better if I choose another material. So that kind of leads me to, to two options, really. I can either use stainless steel or grade 5 titanium. Um, neither of which are, are, are the, the nicest materials to machine. Um, and in the end, I, just, I opted for grade five titanium. So I've got some 13 millimeter um, bar stock and some six millimeter bar stock. Um, the reason I got metric um, is because I don't own a lathe. So I need the bar stock all, uh, uh, as close a fit as possible to the diameters needed. And um, obviously the Tommy bar um, on the tool doesn't really matter what the diameter is and a 13 millimeter is almost perfect fit for the uh, padlock. Um, yeah, so we'll, uh, we'll we'll take it from there and, and have a look at some of these operations and, and machining that goes on here. And I'll say right now, um, a lot of this work would be so much easier if I had to lay just basic stuff like facing that I have to do uh, on the mill. It would be you know seconds worth of work on a on a lathe. Okay.
starting out just facing the end of a piece of bar stock uh, I'm using a Monster Mill uh, 1 8 inch chip breaker uh, running at, at 8 inches a minute and 5100 RPM but I'm only doing a 10% uh, step over here um, because I want to kind of try and keep um, deflection down to an absolute minimum for the best possible surface finish um, it's quite a slow operation as I say uh, a lathe would be so much easier here but now is probably a good time to give a couple of shout outs um, the first one um, is uh, some thanks to Kelvin over at 1 to 10 CNC who took the time to give me some advice on what end mills, coatings, etc. He, he recommend for machining uh, titanium because I don't have a lot of experience uh, machining this stuff. And um, another shout out has to go to Brad at Tactical Keychains. Uh, I appreciate you're a busy guy, but uh, I really appreciated uh, the time you took to advise me on drill geometry, again coatings, and some starting points for, for feeds and speeds. Um, yeah, you can get get this information from from sort of online calculators or books, but it's, that's no substitute from real world experience from someone who, who's been using similar kit on almost on a daily basis. So yeah, thanks a lot, I appreciate it. Here you can see I've actually moved to um, some uh, high-speed machining uh, tool paths here. As a general rule, I don't bother using those on um, on my tool Mac um, for my own reasons. I, I don't think th there's an awful lot of advantage, and in some cases, there's some disadvantages for using them um, with a machine that's not capable of doing a thousand inches a minute. Um, anyway, uh, the reason I decided to use it here was because the first time I attempted um, this cut. You can see the little slot it creates is a, it's about 140 thou wide, and then the, the end mill is obviously one eighth of an inch. And because I'm not using flood coolant, um, it's very difficult to get the heat out when the um, tool is buried that deep into the workpiece. And I actually um, killed the first end mill I attempted this with with traditional tool paths. Um, so I had a read around, had a look, and I think they call it immersion time, and that's the amount of time that the tool is buried into the workpiece. Obviously, if you use uh, sort of some tr tricoidal uh, tool paths like this, it gives the opportunity for the tool to come back out of the work and uh, cool off a little bit between each pass. And that seemed to work out great. Uh, last tool path was running at about 150% uh, depth of cut. I'm moving here to uh, another area clear basically. Um, this time it's only 50 thou deep, um, but it's basically more of the same, just clearing that area out. Here I've just switched out to a, um, a fourth loop to a mill from HTC for finishing the side walls up. Um, you'll see later on it does a pretty good job of finishing up, but uh, yeah, titanium uh, really leaves some birds behind when you machine it.
now you can see that I've now moved apart over to the fourth axis. I'm, I'm back again using the Monster Mill uh, one inch, inch chip breaker for flute. And I'm running it again at uh, 5100 RPM. But this time I've dropped the feed rate to about uh, four inches a minute. Um, and I'm stepping down in uh, 30 pound depths of cut here just to rough that little area out. The tool that I've got loaded here is uh, the HTC um, finishing end mill again for food finisher. And you've just seen I, I came in and ran a finish pass around that little area for the tang. And then I cut a very small ramp on the end of that tang uh, to help it uh, find its way underneath that protrusion on the actuator. Um, and now what I'm doing is I'm just cutting a a relief, a helical relief on the bottom. And this will just prevent the coil spring from being uh, crushed uh, as you press the tool into the padlock to try and grab hold of that. So, sure, right. okay. So here I'm using a 1 8 inch stub length carbide twist drill, it's ALTIN coated, uh, 135 degree point on it. And you can see that the workpiece is flexing ever so slightly in the fourth axis, but uh, I don't mind that um, because the trade-off is I can get it really, really positioned uh, pretty accurately. The final part of the cycle is to um, use my chamfering tool to come in and put a, a 3D chamfer all the way around that hole. It's kind of nice um, using the um, fourth axis to do this because you get a, a proper a geometry chamfer uh, on a curved surface like that. So I've now flipped the part around in the fourth axis uh, to work on the other end. I've just spotted and now I'm uh, drilling with, it's basically the same spec uh, drill bit as I used uh, last time, uh, except this time it's six millimeter in diameter. Um, it's a good indication of, of you really need to be using flood coolant with this. Um, and if I do much more of this, I'm gonna have to set up an enclosure. 
because if you look carefully you'll see some nice glowing uh, parts coming up about now. Um, now obviously I've, when I finish off I'm going to come in and do a chamfer pass with my chamfer tool uh, again to, to get this nice uh, geometry on a, for a chamfer on a curved surface. Right here I've um, just moved the workpiece a little bit further out in the fourth axis so I've got clearance um, for the collar chuck and I'm going to engrave uh, my little logo on there. Um, what I'm using is a 90 degree uh, V-bit and uh, I'm running it at about uh, 3.2 uh, inches a minute at 5100 RPM. Now, I haven't figured out the reason why, but um, every time it does a small arc, it, it decelerates an awful lot. So you'll see the straight lines um, between segments, it, it moves at uh, 3.2 inches a minute. Uh, the small arcs, it moves an awful lot slower. I'm still working on trying to figure that out. This is the final operation. The workpiece is now back in the um, ER collet uh, block in the machine vise. And uh, I'm not going to bore you with this, but it's exactly the same as uh, how it started. It was a facing operation. Uh, so we'll skip ahead, okay? Okay, this last part, I'm just uh, spotting, drilling, and then chamfering uh, the hole on the end for the set screw to hold the Tommy bar in. Um, it's exactly the same drill, but this time it's a number 28. A little bit oversized for 832 threads, but um, it, it's, it's going to be a lot easier for me to, to tap that, being slightly oversized. Um, when I was chamfering the hole uh, with my um, the spot and chamfering tool, because it's effectively a, a uni flute, I have to slow the feed rate right down to about three inches a minute to get a really good surface finish. Okay, uh, last operation is um, I need to tap that uh, 832, but I'm too chicken to do it on the power, so I'll do that by hand. Right, all I did after machining was um, take the part over to my buffing machine and um, buff and burnish it using 120 grit and 400 grit uh, Scotch Bright bristle brushes, um, and that's all that's really needed. Uh, then I brought it over here, I degreased it thoroughly in Windex and I've just rinsed it off in distilled water. 
but um, I'm now going to anodize it, uh, kind of a, a light blue color, uh, around about 24, 25 volts, um, and it's really simple. Um, I'm using commercially pure titanium for a binding wire here to hold the part and also for the two um, plates um, as well. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's just anodize this quick. The trick is to, to leave it in there just long enough um, for the current to drop down, maybe around about uh, 10 milliamps or so, maybe 15 milliamps. Okay, that's the part's done. Um, what I'll do is I'll finish off by anodizing the Tommy bar and then I'll fit the um, the set screw and the brass pin and uh, show you the final part or the, the final tool. Okay so that's the um, hand tool finished now. Um, all I've done is obviously I've um, anodized the, the Tommy bar bronze. Um, I've added uh, an 8 by 32 stainless set screw in the end and a 1 8 inch brass pin in that hole on the side. Um, yeah, I, I think it turned out fairly well. Uh, there's a few marks on this, this side wall here for machining, um, and there's a couple of tiny machining marks on the end. Uh, but it, overall, I'm very happy with the way it turned out. Um, if you're wondering why sometimes you get this kind of mottled appearance on, on anodized um, titanium, well, it's basically, um, as you touch with your fingers, the oils in your, in your, on your skin, cause a refractive index of the um, anodizing to change ever so slightly so you'll get a different slight ever so slightly different color and mottled appearance after you've been handling um, an anodized piece like that. Um, I won't demonstrate this working uh, because I don't really want to put any tiny scratches on it. Um, this is heading out to Eric up in Canada and interestingly enough uh, while I was making this video um, I received a care package from Eric and uh, he sent me this which is the sort of official manufacturer's tool. I've seen photos of these, but I've never actually handled one myself. Um, and uh, looking at it, it, it's, it, it's got similar features to mine. Um, although the width of the tang is significantly smaller and therefore the cross section is, is, is smaller as well. Um, but the biggest difference is is, is in here is these sharp corners. Um, now they've obviously they obviously milled that little slot for the tang, um, as I say, which is busted off um, with the end mill in a different orientation. Um, now, if you have sharp corners like that, you end up focusing the stresses in the corners, and this is the point at which cracks begin to develop and propagate from. Um, it, it's it's kind of kindergarten level stuff. Um, you know what you want is a fillet there or a radius, um, and I'm just wondering why they did it. But the conclusion I'm coming to, and I think uh, I mentioned it to Eric as well, is it's probably it's probably a, um, a feature because if this does sort of end up beginning to crack and then end up those cracks propagate uh, due to fatigue. Well, you just end up with a customer being forced to come back and buy another one of these after a couple of years. And at a hundred and something bucks, that's probably quite nice business. Anyway, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, uh, me making, seeing me make that. Thanks.